I'm going to keep my finger on page down. Whenever it needs to be shifted, you know, scrolled, just say down. <laughs> Avi, I have a suggestion. Can we choose one person to do that so that we're not all shouting down at the same time? Okay. Maybe who wants to shout down? I'm okay with doing it. So I'm going to say down now. <laughs> you, you have the job. It's yours. Okay. Okay. But I, I, I would scroll down already. Okay. Well, okay. In the beginning, we're not going to be reading closely. I'll just okay, show you a couple fine. quick things. Okay. You can also look at it yourself, obviously. But um, this is the same text that I sent uh, earlier, but maybe a little uh, visually a little bit uh, nicer. We are going to be studying Rabbi uh, Kalanimus. Kalanimus? Hey, I mean, just one thing. Can you, uh, I think you can probably minimize the, uh, the heading over there. Get off the, uh, take off the, the formatting heading. You press take the, off the what? The formatting heading on the page so you can see more of the page. If you press oh. the, the, on the upper, up arrow, maybe, on the right, maybe. Uh huh, okay. Okay, that makes it a little lovely. Better. Yep. We yeah. can also go like this, and then we can make it even bigger. Good. Okay. okay All right. So again, <laughs> again, we're doing the Hasidic Rebbe, but unlike last time, we're not doing one of the original, you know, the the first generations. Yeah. We're doing a Hasidic Rebbe is much closer to our uh, own time and this person Avi, is... your volume is very low can you be closer to your microphone All right, let's see what i can do hold on is this better yes okay i'm gonna i'm gonna mute everybody except for avi so so we, so we don't have background noise okay hold on a minute Well, exactly. everybody, everybody can can break break in just by pressing the space bar. And talk. Okay, the the figure that we're going to be studying is a wonderful, beautiful personality, but also a uh, a very uh, tragic figure, or or perhaps tragic uh, story. He was the Rebbe of the Hasidim in a Polish town that the Poles called Piasechnu, I think. Wait a minute. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play it for you. This is how it's pronounced in Polish, because nobody who studies this person can pronounce his name. Piasechnu. Piasechnu in Polish, and in Yiddish it's Piasechne. Okay, that's how the Jews call the town. The Jews were about a third of the population of this town on the eve of the uh, Holocaust. The person that we're studying, the Hasidic Rebbe of the town, um, he, was, he was very well respected and revered and uh, loved during his lifetime. When the Nazis came, he was born in 1889, and when the Nazis came into the town, he went with the population to the uh, Warsaw Ghetto. And in the Warsaw Ghetto, he became known as the, the Rebbe of the children of the Warsaw Ghetto. And that came out of his past career. He was well known as uh, an educator, an educator who educated from deep inside the heart. That's what we're going to see uh, uh, tonight, one of the things we're going to see tonight. And he also died as the Rebbe of the uh, children of the Warsaw Ghetto. The only book that he wrote that was published in his lifetime is a book called Chovata Talmidim, the, the, uh, the student's obligation. It was written for school children. It was a kind of spiritual guide for children who go to school. And it's written, it's written at that level. It's written at the level, I, I don't mean, I don't mean to, to put it down, I mean the opposite. It's written in, in a way 
that a that that someone would speak to uh, to a child, okay, in a way that the child uh, can understand. And this book was followed by a few sequels, which were not published in his lifetime, for older students, for avrichi, meaning uh, kolel students, and then one for uh, adult Hasidim. Okay, all of these sequels, even though they remained unpublished, they were related to this first book that he published in his lifetime, the book that he wrote for the school children, um, Chovat Talmudim. Finally, his last book was a book, it was simply a notebook. It was a notebook full of the sermons that he gave in Yiddish in the Warsaw Ghetto under Nazi rule. And in a miraculous fashion, this uh, notebook was found in, uh, in a tin can or something like that in the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto after the Holocaust, accompanied by a note which said that if anyone finds this, please send it to uh, my relatives in Palestine so that they can publish it. And it was published, um, it was published uh, under the title of Esh Kodesh, the Holy Fire. And ultimately it became perhaps his most famous book besides the book that we're looking at now called uh, Chovat Talmudim. Now in some ways, He's a little bit similar to uh, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the Ramchal. If you remember the Ramchal, the Ramchal tried to, tried to take the Kabbalah and explain it in very clear terms that anybody can understand. Okay? In a similar way, Rav Kalanim is Kalman Shapira is trying to take Kabbalistic ideas, and this is what Hasidim do. He, uh, he tries to make these ideas, you know, to tell these ideas in a way that a child can understand them, that a young man can understand them, to speak to the person from where they're coming, uh, from where they're coming from, as, like Israel, at, at eye level, the Gova Einai. And he, he does this uh, beautifully, as in the text that we're going to see. Nonetheless, there's a gigantic difference between the Ramchal and Rav Kalanimus Kalman Shapira. And the difference is that the Ramchal, as we saw, spoke to the mind. He wanted to present the Kabbalah in a way that the mind can digest it, okay? That it makes sense, logically. Whereas Rav Kalanimus Kalman Shapira, as we'll, we'll see tonight, he speaks to the heart. He speaks very directly. He's talking to you. He's not talking about something. He's talking to you and he's talking about you. It's very direct. And it's, again, it's aimed for the heart rather than for the, uh, rather than for the mind. So I'm gonna go back to the text now. And the things I told you are in this uh, very brief introduction. And the text you're seeing, by the way, I'll just show you, if you can see my face also, is really from my book. This is a book that I uh, wrote on prayer many years ago. And I took this section and included it as part of uh, an appendix. And that's how, I had the, uh, that's how I had the text available. I'll let you all in on a secret that um, about a month ago, maybe, maybe a little more even, maybe a month and a half ago, I didn't know what to do because I had to teach this course with English language readings from all of these sixth grade Jewish mystics, right? And I didn't have English text for them. Now, that wouldn't be such a problem if Lab is closed. I mean, these things have been translated into English, but I didn't have any access to, it, to an English translation like to scan or to, or to type. So I asked for help, you know, social, what do you call it? Social, uh, not the opposite <laughs> social um like fishing is that what it's called where you try to like get collaborative information from people over over things like facebook there's a name for that whatever so um so i asked people for help and i did get a help and one fellow sent me a really nice collection of uh of texts on some of these people 
And after I did that, I realized, what the heck? Okay, 23 years ago, I published this text and I still had it typed up on my computer. Okay, so, uh, so that's the text that you're, that you're seeing now, which is something that literally I typed 23 years ago and somehow it's, uh, it's still preserved in my hard drive or, uh, or on my Dropbox. Hmm. Okay, now I'm going to ask if uh, someone could read, okay? And I'll keep shifting down whenever our volunteer says the word down, okay? Who's willing to read? Come on, you're not all that bashful. I, we have a couple of veteran readers here. Brian, you want to read us? When I'm finished eating, I'll read, but I'm eating my dinner. Ah. Simcha volunteered. What? Simcha volunteered. Simcha volunteered. All right. From New Mexico, we get this. No, message. from Mexico. Why did I say New, New Mexico? I meant New Mexico City. We're having this text read. Okay. Uh, gradually, accustom your heart and soul to open and pour outward toward God in meditation and prayer. Both children and adults whose spiritual knowledge is undeveloped think that the troubles and concerns that are the impetus for prayer are really what prayer is all about. Their approach to prayer is comparable to the approach a poor man might take when asking a rich man for help or that of a commoner imploring a, a king for aid or salvation. But only an ignorant person thinks of praying in the fashion, in this fashion, thus depriving it of its spiritual significance as if its full meaning derived from calamities and disturbances and believers that if he had no pressing necessities, he would not be in prayer. In reality, it is the process of down <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I need. Okay. Well, oh, I see. Oh, the space bar doesn't work. Wait. Uh, wait. Uh, uh, no. Wait, 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 wait. Um. Wait. Okay. Uh, okay. We're in the right place now. Okay. In reality, it is a process of prayer itself during which the heart is drawn. Wait. Wait. You lost me moving that. Hold on a second. Oh, hold on a second. Gradually, a cut. What, what sentence? I, I got lost. Hold on. Um. In reality, in reality, it is the process of prayer itself during which the heart is drawn close to God and the soul flows out toward Him. That is the most important aspect of prayer. Moreover, as you will see in the following words from the Midrash. Not only does prayer not derive its importance from our crises and troubles, but at times God sends troubles and concerns our way in order to provoke us to pray. The Midrash Exodus Rabbah 1 says, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi stated, We need to go down. Okay. Just, oh, just the word down is enough. Too okay. Too much. Yeah. A little bit of mm. can I can I suggest something? It may yes. take a little moment now. I did open my computer, but I don't okay. have the ID I, um, number. I have the password, but not the ID. If you give me the ID and walk me through this, it will be. I think over time, will save time. So, what is the ID number for this meeting? Six me I, I can so give that's it. That's the password. It's nine seven one mm -hmm. six eight three eight. Wait, six no. eight three eight. Go on. Nine three three three. Okay, nine seven one six eight three eight nine three three three. So now I'm going to join, and I'm going to put in six mystics. Is it a capital M or no? Capital yes. M in the password. First, you have to put in the code, yeah, yeah, then it'll got, ask for the password. I've got the password up already. 
except it's not typing for some reason. Hold on. Uh, I, six, Miss Dix. Okay, I'm joining the meeting. Somebody may need to let me in. Okay, I'm here. Hello. Now, I'm going to join without video. Okay. Um, now I need to be let in. Just a moment. I'm going to stop share in that case. No, you don't need to stop. What? You don't need to stop. Oh, okay. okay. More, more so, now share, so now share screen. Now, now you, now you. Oh, now, just a sec. Okay. You are now close. Now you can share a screen. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. Wait, I have to join with the audio first. Although I have audio on my comp on my telephone. We hear you. Okay. All right. So mm. let's see. Um, and I'm doing share screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So you may need to make me a co-host again. Or maybe there can only be one co-host. I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry. All right, well, see. Let me see. I don't know. I'll, I'll take off Avi. I'm so. Wait. Then we can't see Avi. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. If I speak, you'll see me anyways. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I actually. I'm putting I'm putting my video on I think yeah just so that now share screen it still says host disabled participant screen sharing so I can't share it I don't know why that is let me see don't either uh, maybe I do I need to refresh it somehow is there a way to do that no I don't know I don't know why that why you have a problem with that oh me neither um, Abby sent the link to share to share to access directly. Okay, why don't you try again? There, I've got it. Excellent. So you now, how do I find the text? You have to put it on your screen. Share all my stuff. You have to open. I have to open the file on your Is, screen. Are you seeing my stuff? No, not not the not the file. You just just click on the link that I sent. The last link that I sent. How can I look, it will click appear on that in your browser? It's not in my, how do I go to my browser to find that? I'm closing this down because I really don't want people seeing what I have in my home computer. So how do I go to my browser? I, I, I mean, I mean, I'm in my browser. You're in your browser. Do you have I'm, WhatsApp see, in your browser? No, I do not. I didn't know I you needed that. you have WhatsApp that. on your telephone? Yes, but I can't. Okay, then I. All right. Well, yes. let, let's let's let's. Let, I'm just, sorry. Let me, let me do it, uh, and I'll, we'll, we'll we're going to bump around here for the next ten minutes trying to do this. Let me uh, let me open it up. Hold on a second. Uh, I'm sorry. I was okay. trying to make it easier, and I've complicated it, but it's really very cumbersome for the reader to read okay, and hold. have it keep shifting around. Hold on. Let me open up uh, the proper thing here and uh, share the screen. Uh, let's look at share screen. Where are we? Here we are. All right. Everybody see it? Excellent. Yes. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> so just enlarge it now. Enlarge it by control. Not, not by increasing the font, by doing control plus. No, it's not doing it. Hold on a second. Click, yeah, you clicked in and now, now do control plus no. several times. Oh, you can do it that way too. You can do more, do 200. 150, okay. Even 200 though. 200? Yeah. Okay, I'm going on mute now, thank you. Okay, thanks for trying. I just skip yeah. down, skip down, down now to where we were roughly. In reality. So since, since we had this well-meant introduction, and thanks for the uh, for for trying, all of you, um, let, let's talk a little bit about what this is about. We taught last week when we were dealing with the uh, first uh, Rebbe of uh, Chabad. We talked about how Hasidic prayer um, denies personal need. Okay, you're not supposed to be praying for yourself. You're supposed to be praying for the Shekhinah, for the uh, Divine Spirit. If we are in pain, it means that she is in pain. And it's her pain that we should be uh, praying for. He's dealing with that here. And he's also dealing with a related question. 
the related question is, um, the related question is, why do we suffer? Okay, and one of the answers to that question has to do with prayer. In fact, I'm going to tell you a midrash that he does not quote, and we'll compare them afterwards, but I'll tell you the midrash now. There's a famous midrash that says, why were our matriarchs, Sarah and Rebecca and, um, and uh, Rachel, why were they barren? Why were they childless? The Midrash answers in Hebrew, Ki HaKadosh Baruch Hu litfilatam shel tzadikim. Okay? Because the Holy One, blessed be He, desires the prayers of the righteous. So when righteous people suffer, one, one, well, one thing the Midrash is uh, suggesting about that is that it's God banging on the door. It's God trying to remind the person to turn to him. It's God looking for a connection. And sometimes in our lives, when everything is hunky-dory, right, we don't feel that there's any need to pray. And only when things are rough, all right, that's when we uh, think of uh, turning to God. And we, we, all, we all know that the phrase that uh, there's no uh, atheist in a foxhole, and we've all been exposed to people like who prayer was never part of their lives, and as soon as there was a tragedy, they turned to prayer. And that's not perhaps the way it's supposed to be, but uh, the, uh, the uh, Rebbe of Piaschene is suggesting that that sometimes is the way that it is, okay? If you think you're praying for yourself, then you're not going to pray unless you need something. But if you think that prayer is more than that, then you will pray anyways. And he quotes a different midrash than the one that I uh, than the one that I told you now. Okay, with the text that Don is showing, it's the last two lines where it says the uh, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi stated, and I think if uh, if Simcha could start reading from there again, it would be perfect. You ready? Simcha? Yes. Yes. Okay. In reality, it is a process of prayer itself, during which the heart is drawn close to God and the soul flows out towards Him. That is the most important aspect of prayer. Moreover, as you will see in the following words from the Midrash, not only does prayer not derive its importance from our crises and troubles, but at times God sends troubles and concerns our way in order to provoke, provoke us to pray. The Midrash Exodus Rabbah 1 says, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi stated, to what can it prayer be compared to a king who was traveling and heard the voice of a princess who was being attacked by bandits crying out for help. The king saved her. After a time, he decided that he wanted to marry her. He tried to speak to her, but she refused to speak to him. What did the king do? He sent his bandits out to frighten her again so that she would cry out to him for help and he would have the opportunity to hear and respond to her. Okay. Before we go on, what do you say about that? Uh, that he wanted to do his ways. <laughs> he what? That the king wanted to have her, so he pushed her to do what he uh, considered was correct. Uh, in order for her to, to need help, and he was the one who was going to provide it. Uh-huh. And, uh, okay. And also the text states that uh, when we face troubles and concerns, yeah. we need to wash them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, note something that the text says, everybody, okay? The king saved her, and then I'm at the top line in, in what Don is showing. 
The king saved her, and after a time, he decided that he wanted to marry her. He, he fell in love with her. Okay, so he wants to marry her. He tried to speak to her, but she refused to speak to him. Now think about it. He's the king. Can he marry her against her will? Of course. Most likely, yes. Most likely, he can. But that's not exactly what he does, okay? The, the, what, the, the thing that hurts here is that she refused to speak to him. He wanted a connection to her. So what did he do? He didn't like send his army to, to bring her to a wedding hall. Rather, he sent the bandits out to frighten her again so that she would cry out to him for help and he would have the opportunity to hear and respond to her. What the king is looking for is a connection. Avi. Yeah. It's Kara. Um, by now, I think you've got some sense that I'm going to think that's a very manipulative. <laughs> it's extremely it's manipulative. Okay. <laughs> it's extremely manipulative. Yeah. And, um, I, I mean, I get it. Same thing, like I got the, you know, the one last week manipulating Jews with saying I'm a pro czar. I get it. Yeah. I don't like it. You don't have to like it. Just in fact, saying. There's, in fact, there's lots of people who don't like it. I mean, you can take it in an awful way to think that all of the cruelty that happens to uh, righteous people is just because God wants them to to turn to him what does that say what does that mean okay it's not an easy uh it's not an easy uh, uh thing to uh to live with okay at the same time it's something emotional that does exist among human beings right with human beings you might hope you might wish, you might even find a way to manipulate things so that a person, right, who seems to have forgotten you will remember you. You're it's a relationship of being dependent and not a relationship of one-on-one -on -one, uh, as an appreciation. I, I think, I think it's, it's not, I think it's not equal, that. you're saying. Sorry? You're saying that it's not equal. No, it definitely isn't equal, but it seems to be one of, you come to God because you're dependent. Yes. You need I mean, to be rescued. Else oh, but, 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 but that's exactly it. Does God want you to come to him because you're dependent? It would seem that way if he's setting up circumstances that the, whoa, or he thinks that the whoa. only way you're going with, to come to him is... With all due really respect, that, with all due respect, that's not fair. No, okay? But there are lots the of times when her, you pray to and God and after a time he decided that he wanted to marry her, meaning that uh, the king, the king did not want her to be... In, in other words, the, the business with the bandits at the end was not what the king wanted. The king wanted her to respond to him, just to respond to him. I, I think there's, a, there's, you have to remember this is a parable. It's not, it's not, a, right. it's, only, it's only a way of expressing this relationship. What, what it reminds me of is uh, Heschel. And Heschel, yes. the way he discusses, uh, uh, and Booger, I and Dao, and, and Heschel talks about God uh, having a full relationship with with people, with yeah. with human with humankind, and and uh, and and this uh, this interaction that goes on, and what what the mm. parable is trying to say is that this interaction is going on, and and God is seeking man in a sense. Yes. In fact, there's a passage that we're going to get to uh, tonight, where the Piyashin Rebbe almost sounds exactly like Buber. And the funny part of it is, is that they were contemporaries. They were the same generation. From different angles. I wonder if they even met. 
Well, he was in Poland and, and Buber was in Germany and in the United States. So likelihood. When Germany, he was in, he was in uh, Buber was in Israel after, you know, but after right. 1939, but they were, they were contemporaries and they were from the same Poland and uh, who knows? Who knows what uh, might have transpired? But he definitely sounds like Buber in a passage that we're going to get to uh, later. What you have here is, I mean, when, when people are saying very understandably that this king in some ways doesn't even sound very nice, okay? When people say that, th you know, think about human beings. Maybe, maybe it's not the, the, the nicest thing or maybe it's not the purest thing. But human beings are, are willing to go to, 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 to take all kinds of measures in order to connect with the people that they want to connect to. And here what you're describing is you're describing God like a person. God in search of man, like, uh, like Don just said. And God is constantly feeling ignored. So God sends us troubles to remind us of him, to remind us that there's somebody to turn to. I think it would be better if we actually read the explanation of the parable, which is in, in the next paragraph. Go ahead, Simcha. You certainly understand on your own the significances of the parable. Your soul is a princess that the Holy One, blessed be he, wishes to marry. That is to say, he wants the soul to draw near to him and unite with him in holiness. To accomplish this, it is necessary to speak to God and to pray to him. For through inner prayer that emerges from the recesses of the heart, the soul is awakened from its slumber. It longs for and, the unites, and then unites with the king, the king of the universe. This is the primary purpose and goal of prayer. Certain programs are visited on a person specifically to cause him to pray and cry out to God from the depths of his heart and soul. Just as the king in the parable sent the bandits to frighten the princess so that she would cry out to him. When you wish to awaken your soul and in prevent it from sleeping, no, hold on. Wait, wait, I'm kind of lost, lost where we are. Yeah. For sleeping or withdrawing deeper under cover during prayer, you too should cause yourself at first by concentrating on those things that pain you or that you need. To this end, you should focus during the formal amida on your immediate needs and desires, both spiritual and material. For example, during the prayers for spiritual knowledge, you, gra uh, you grace man with wisdom and repentance. Return us, Father, to our Torah. Focus on the longing inside you that God open your heart and soul to Torah and divine service. During the prayer for a beautiful year, bountiful year, bless us with a good year, which is not only about agriculture and crops, but about material sustenance in general, pull your soul out and stir up your heart as you ask God to send you, your parents a means of livelihood. He's speaking of, he's speak, remember he's speaking to a child. The child isn't going to pray for Parnassah. The child doesn't go to work. The child goes to school. But he tells the child, ask God to help your parents earn a means of livelihood. Hey, go on. While you pray, your soul will awaken and be revealed and will unite with its king to whom it belongs. Mm -hmm. Soon. Soon. Soon, this will occur not only when you are praying for your personal needs. Once you have accustomed your soul to rise and to awaken, you will find yourself even more suffused Suffused. with true fear, fiery passion when you are focusing on godly matters. When you recite, you are holy and your name is holy, your soul will become activated and will actually feel itself standing 
right before the source of holiness, mm. directly addressing this source and praying, praising him. Inflame your soul will dissolve into the lovely, holy pleasantness of the Holy One of Israel. You will be similarly inspired during all of prayer. Okay. You should not confine this kind of prayer to the three obligatory services of the morning, afternoon, and evening. All day, you should try to find free moments when you can meditate before God in prayer and song. The more you accustom yourself to this kind of soul meditation, the softer your heart will become. Your spirit will lift and your soul will draw closer to God. The, the goal that he's presenting here to the child is a person who's talking to God all the time, in any given moment, turning to God and thinking of God and talking to God. Okay? You will be able, however, to rouse your soul to speak to God only if you strengthen the cognitive basis of your faith. You must think about God's glory, fills the whole universe, and how you yourself exist within him and his holiness, even though you cannot see him. More than a single thought is necessary, the more you reflect on these matters of faith over and over again, constantly the easier it will become to stimulate your soul to speak to God, who faces you at all, at all times yes it may still be difficult for you to imagine that you are standing before god and that your soul during prayer has become stirred and inflamed because it is actually in the presence of him whose glory fills the whole universe you exist after all in a material world your eyes see only the physical universe and your hands touch only concise concrete matter Look then toward the sky and contemplate, focus your mind and think. I exist on this side, while on the other side of the heavens, there is another world, completely different from this one. There are angels there and seraphim, the souls of the patriarchs and of the prophets and Zedakim. The true of glory is suspended in their midst and God create holy and awesome is present on the throne in the world god is hidden while there are awesome well there he is while there his splendorous presence is very much apparent and revealed strengthen yourself look and think some more i stand on this side of the divine and i say Blessed are you, O Lord. It is you, Lord, the one toward whom I lift my eyes, whether as I see you or not. It is you that I bless. I shut my eyes and look at you and bless you and speak to you. Okay, this is something very typical for this book and for the Columbus Common Shapira as a whole. He constantly tells you to imagine things. He describes things so that you can almost see them in your eye. You can see them standing before you. You can see them above you and visualize them, okay? The imagination is very important for coming close to God. He's going to continue in the next paragraph with some more imagination. Go ahead. Listen. Okay, <laughs> listen, listen and you will hear how far your gaze reaches. But you reach when you lift your eyes toward God. The tour, Ora Haim, quotes some of the following passage, which is found in the Sefer Hechalot. He he Just be aware, Sefer Hechalot is an early mystical work which describes the halls and palaces, uh, palaces of heaven. It's like describing God's house up in the heavens and the wonders that are there. 
And it's not, uh, it's not uh, accidental that he's quoting that book here. Okay, go ahead. The Lord has said, Oh, you heavens and you angelic beings who descend past the holy chariot. You will be blessed by God if you tell my children how I respond when they sanctify me and recite, Holy, Holy, Holy. Teach them to lift their eyes towards their prayers and receive that is toward heaven. And this is the gate of heaven. Tell them to lift themselves upward. My greatest pleasure in the world is to see them in, lift their eyes toward me. My eyes gaze back into their eyes. I grip the throne of glory, which has the image of Jacob impressed upon it. I lovingly embrace and kiss every you. I remember their exile and speed up the process of their redemption. What can, what I can, what can we what? say in the face of such a description? Picture it to yourself. Our eyes look upward as if we were looking directly into his eyes. He gazes back at us and is delighted by our gaze. It is as if parent and child were looking at each other's face. Okay. face. The father cannot restrain himself. His love overwhelms him and he reaches out and hugs and kisses the child, his child. The heart dissolves in bliss and longing. The soul bursts out of its confines and in fiery enthusiasm calls out. Toward my father, my holy one, I rise, I fly. Okay. This is how he's trying to encourage a child to pray. Have you ever heard anything like this in any of your lives? Have you ever been in a synagogue where, where children or adults pray in this way? Yes. Yeah? Where? Somehow I think when, when there's like, a, a, for example, in the women's study day, there are times that uh, prayers, uh, you can feel this kind of a, a sensation. You, I, I missed where you said you can feel it. Where? For example, myself, uh, uh, when I attended the, the women's study day, and there are moments of uh, tefillot, like uh, in community, mm -hmm. I, yes. I feel like this. It's like uh, when you close your eyes and completely surrender. I felt it at uh, Keila Takerem, and uh, I think when our attitude mm -hmm. is uh, focused in him, rather in what's going around and uh, certainly closing our eyes helps to to govern and to approach this uh, 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 spiritual level. Did, did, did you feel like you were looking into God's eyes and God was looking back at you and smiling? I, I felt that when uh, uh, I had like a face like a very big uh, trouble in all realms and uh, at some point i i feel like uh, he's patting me and re and telling me i'm in control and and you're my child and and uh, and it's going to be fine okay we don't so, say that it happens every day but uh but it depends in our altitude that that's something that i could say okay um, so some people, as uh, Simcha says, that uh, she's felt some, something like this. There are well, maybe some of us who have witnessed something like this or, or felt something like this. But I think it's fair to say that prayer isn't usually taught to children in this way. I, I can certainly say that, you know, once upon a time I was a, a teacher in, uh, in an elementary school and nothing like that in an Orthodox Jewish elementary school, and nothing like this uh, existed. I don't remember in Hebrew school something like this being discussed, or in Bar Mitzvah lessons something like, that, like this being discussed. This is how he thinks a child should be spoken, uh, uh, to, uh, spoken to about prayer. 
And this is, and he's trying to get the child to imagine and to, and to visualize the things that, th th these things when he prays. He's also trying to get the child to talk to God all the time, okay? Whenever you feel a need. And then if you do it whenever you feel a need, you'll do it even when you don't feel a need. That God is someone you can always talk to and God is someone in whose eyes you can always look just like he compares it to the child's father. Yeah. Avi, um, yes. I kind of had the impression that part of this is incorporated in the Shema. How in the Shema? Love your Lord, your God, um, going out, coming in, and essentially to, to be aware of God in all of your activities of the day. Okay. Okay, that fits. If you love God with all your heart, then you're going to be turning to God and looking for God all the time. So you're right, it does fit. Okay. Uh, let's go on. Look at the sky and meditate on these things. Strengthen and give courage to your eyes and your heart and gaze with intensity and concentration. Be especially aware when addressing God as you even if you are not gazing, God word at that exact moment. Be very aware of the meaning of you. Focus your mind on the fact that it is God who is before you, God whom you are addressing as you. Okay. Please. Earl, wait, wait a second. Don earlier said that this reminds him of Martin Buber. And I responded that pretty soon we're going to get to a paragraph that will sound exactly like Martin Buber. This is the paragraph. He says, be especially aware when addressing God as you. Focus your mind, right? That, uh, excuse me. Be very aware of the meaning of you. Uh, Buber was I and thou, right? That was you. And Buber always talked about relating to other people, not as objects, but as you, as as, as someone that there's a, a tie to, an, an inner tie to. And Buber thought of God as the ultimate thou or the, or the uh, ultimate you. I think the best way to, to understand the paragraph and what he's saying about you is to contrast it to something very different, okay? He is coming from a Kabbalistic, mystical, Hasidic tradition. And out of that tradition, he, he, he takes this, 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 uh, this, this fiery desire to connect to God and to talk to God as a you, just like you'd want to talk to your father, okay, with a human personal connection. That's what he does. I want to contrast that to somebody who was also very close to this time and did the exact opposite. You've all heard of, I think, Rabbi uh, uh, Shamshim Raphael Hirsch, Samson Raphael Hirsch. Okay? Yeah. He was a German Orthodox rabbi in the 19th century, maybe a generation older than, uh, than the, the person that we're reading now. And he tried to present Judaism to the German Jews of his time in a rational way. Germany was a highly intellectual uh, society, and the Jews wanted to be part of this rational world. Now, Hirsch saw that so many young Jews, okay, so many young Jews were leaving traditional ways, were leaving what Hirsch called orthodoxy. And he wrote a book called The 19 Letters, where he he, he takes a typical German Jew, he calls him Benjamin, it's a fictional character. He writes 19 letters to this young German Jew, and through the correspondence, he, he convinces the uh, young German Jew to, uh, to come back to uh, 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 traditional Judaism. Now Hirsch, when he talks about the Shimona Esrei, when he talks about the, uh, the central prayer, 
he also talks about you. He also emphasizes the word you. But he does it in a very different way. What he does is he paraphrases the prayer. He restates the prayer in German. Okay. He, but he doesn't translate it. He restates it. The prayer, as I think all of you know, the Shemona Esrei, is made up of blessings. And in each blessing you have Baruch Ata Adonai. Blessed are you, O Lord. There is I, I'm the person praying. There is you, you're the person, God, that I'm praying to. Okay, it's an I, thou, an I, you relationship. I am turning to somebody else and talking to somebody else. That's the traditional uh, text. When, her, when Hirsch translate the, translates that text, he does the following. I'll, I'll give you an example from, uh, from what uh, Shapira mentioned. He mentioned the blessing of um, livelihood. He tells the child, ask God to provide your parents with a livelihood. So that blessing says, uh, uh, bless us, Lord our God, bless the year, bless the produce of the land. And in the blessing, you can say, please, God, send Parnassah, send the livelihood, help my business, uh, help me in my job, okay? Help me find a job, whatever, whatever it may be. And it's you, oh Lord, okay? I, I'm speaking to you. Please help me with all of these things. That's what the blessing says. Okay. Now, when the church okay. paraphrases the blessing, okay. well, just, one second, just to finish, when, we, when he paraphrases the blessing, he paraphrases it like this. You must know that it is God above who blesses the years. You must know that it is God who brings up the produce of the field. You must know that it is God who provides a livelihood to each and every person. And what he does is he turns the you instead of God, the you is the person praying, meaning you're not really talking to God, you're really talking to yourself. That's what Hirsch does. And, and it's a rational thing. It's very rational to say that prayer is not meant to change God. Prayer is meant to change me. It's meant to do something inside of me or for me or help me realize something or something along those, la those lines. That's a rationalistic way to explain prayer. And it works. And a lot of people really like that explanation. But Rabbi Kalanim, his common Shapira, would have fainted right, if he heard that explanation. The whole point of prayer for him is to connect to a you, to connect to a thou, almost like Martin Buber. Okay, you're really talking to someone else. You're really looking someone else in the eye when you pray. Okay, may I just say something about that? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, in every shul, uh, as far as I know, there's always that plaque uh, made. Just to remind you, it's, it's not empty words, but there's somebody uh, uh, listening on the other end of the phone. Okay. You're saying, you're asking me if they have that sign in here's your shul. Is that what you're asking me? I'm not really asking so much as making a statement. I'm saying that's why. Okay. Perhaps you're saying here's your philosophy mind. doesn't fit that, with that, that uh, to, to focus the mind. Yeah. You're focusing the mind on somebody else, right? You're focusing the mind on God. That doesn't fit too well with Hirsch's view of prayer, but it fits perfectly with Rav Kalanimus Kaman Shapira's view of prayer. Okay. Let's go on in the text where we're, uh, we're most of the way through it. Um, Simcha, are you willing to continue reading? Yes. Okay, please do not think. Look at the sky and meditate on these things. Strengthen and give courage to your eyes and your heart and gaze with intensity 
and concentration. Be especially aware when addressing God as you, even you are not gazing skyward at that exact moment, be very aware of the meaning of you. Focus your mind on the fact that it is God who is before you, God whom you are addressing as you. Please do not think that the only way to arouse and awaken your soul are through the techniques we have described. This is not the case. Every you who has a minimum of internal self-discipline, ever you who works on himself, will from time to time discover methods and means that aid him in arousing, arousing his soul, igniting and inspiring it to transcend the holy, its usual place and drew closer to God. At times, thoughts and flashes of awakening that you had neither anticipated nor prepared for will visit you. For example, you may be in the middle of the prayer service during the days of all. The congregation is beginning to sing songs of praise to God, so, such as, you are our God, and you begin to sing with them. All of a sudden, your heart is gripped, gripped by fear. Now is the time you realize that all the beings of the supernal worlds, along with beings of the lower worlds, sing to the great God who transcends all of them. What connection do I, degraded as I am, have to them? How do I have the audacity to blend my voice in with the voices of those who sing to God and cause him to rejoice? Hmm. Suddenly, it is as if a spirit of life, of strength, were blown into you. You realize this is the way it is when great joy is manifest in the world. The bands and orchestra with their instruments march, playing through the streets, accompanied by the wedding party, while all the important guests celebrate joyfully. The red barefoot children, their clothes tattered and their feet black with dirt. Hold on. Mm -hmm chase after the wedding procession, racing and clapping, singing and celebrating. This is also considered part of the honor accorded the bride and groom and the wedding. Your soul perceives at that moment the great choir of angels that is singing before, before God. The children of Israel join them in song from the lower worlds. Together they sing to the King of Glory while he listens attentively, joyfully, and majestic. Like a barefoot, practically key child, you have chased and joined this group. And along with the holy choir, you sing a song to the God whom you have longed for. Your joy increases, your spirit expands to the breaking point in a state of great excitation, until at times your heart seems to melt and you begin to cry more freely open more freely even than you cried at call it ray wow this is beautiful and it addresses a uh, a major problem uh in a major question in modern times there's there's two ways where humility or um or hubris can prevent prayer. Human beings can tell themselves, like he does here, who am I to pray? Who am I to talk to the creator of the universe? I'm nothing compared to him. And that kind of thought can, can prevent prayer. If people see themselves as too small or as too meaningless, they won't pray. The opposite is also true. If people see themselves as too much, as too great, as too self-sufficient, as too powerful, okay, then they also won't pray. You might say that in pre-modern times, the first question was, uh, was more widespread, and that in modern times, the second question is more widespread. In modern times, it's especially effective to say, 
that prayer is degrading, right? You're, you're a, a human being and you're a man or a woman. Why do you need to bow? Why do you need to bend the knee? Why do you need to supplicate? Why do you need to beg? There is begging in prayer too. Why do, why do you need to do all of that? It's degrading. So both of these questions, uh, both of these questions exist, these two opposite questions. He addresses the first question, who am I to pray to God? I, I'm, I'm nothing. And he does it in, in, a, in a fantastic and in an unexpected way. There's, there's other answers to that question. The answer that he gives is, well, maybe I'm small. Maybe I'm poor. Maybe I'm the least of the people of my town. But that doesn't matter because the king is honored when everyone comes to honor the king, rich and poor and learned and uh, ignorant and, uh, and, and, and performers and, and those who, who don't know how to perform. Each one of them plays their role, even if it's just the role of the children of the town to run after the, the wedding procession, and that's a way of honoring the bride and the groom. Even that is a kind of participation. So it's not who am I, how can I pray? Rather, it's what is my role amongst everyone else in the, uh, in the praise of God? And that's what he did in the paragraph that uh, Simcha just read. Okay, let's go on, unless there's questions or comments. Yeah, I, I have a comment. Yeah. It um, reminds me of the story of the eminent rabbi, I think it was it Yom Kippur or uh, Rosh Hashanah. He, he had a stone in each pocket, but one, it, it was, uh, I am, but remind, remind me, I am but dust and ashes, and the other, uh, it was for, for my sake the way the universe was created. Ah, right. For my sake and also uh, for nothing. It's also like it's also like the famous midrash. Why was the human being created last in the six days of creation? Okay. If a person is uh, humble, then God says, "Look, I created everything before you. I wanted it all ready for you." Everything that you see was created for you. You're not nothing. But if a person is, um, is, uh, is too proud, if a person is too stuck up, then God says, who do you think you are? Even a gnat was created before you. Okay, let's finish the text, the first text at least. This spontaneous arousal will occur only if you labor over and over again to awaken your soul so as not to slip away the 70 years of your life with a heart of stone. Know that even among our sadikim and holy men who elevated themselves and achieved a closeness at God, this is impossible for us even to grasp. There were those who used all kinds of different methods and techniques to rouse their pure and holy souls when they were first setting out along their path. The book House of House of uh, Aaron, um, for example, describes how the Sadikim would imagine just before they got up to pray that they were lying in their graves experiencing much suffering until someone came by and said, rise, stand up and pray. You yourself can picture how imagining that scenario in a vivid way would add tremendous vigor and intensity to prayer. And you, diligent student, if you make use of different techniques and work at them, you are also capable of reaching greatness that is beyond your capacity at present to imagine. Mm. This is a fundamental choice that is offered you to awaken and uplift yourself and draw a little closer to holiness. And at the moment of your ascent, look down from the perspective of your pure and elevated soul on the smallness that you usually keep yourself locked into. 
Look at your capacity for laziness and at the other undesirable qualities that affect you. Look at the low, lowly state of consciousness you normally exist in with your petty thoughts and desires. You yourself will feel ashamed of them. Address yourself antagonistically. Why do I lie around all day in a muddy pit, a virtual outhouse of childish and foolishness? From now on, I take it upon myself to become a you who is a servant of God, master of the universe. I want to be a you. I accept upon myself to be your true servant. Repeat these kind of thoughts and speeches a number of times with God's help. They will aid you a great deal. One of the natural laws of the soul is that it will submit to words that are spoken from the heart. You can seduce and convince another with words that emerge from your heart and soul. Certainly, you can influence yourself decisively in the same way, providing you speak your words at a time when you have raised yourself to spiritual heights and are in a state of self transcendence He's asking the child to talk to himself. Tell yourself what you need to hear. And if you tell yourself what you need to hear from the heart, if you do it with passion, then your soul will listen to you. Okay, this is very, very uh, uh, Hasidic. Can I share something, Abby? Please, yes. Uh, some of you know that... Uh, from a few years ago, I was doing research on the, the history of uh, dancing um, uh, in the people of Israel. And a uh, couple of things came out from the previous text that we read. Uh, one was related with wedding dances that, as you stated, even the poorest uh, person have the privilege to dance in front of the bride and groom. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing that, uh, that was in the uh, Hasidic uh, philosophy is that uh, it was our way of prayer, dancing and, uh, and singing unto Hashem. And this I liked it uh, very much because of, uh, they stated an explanation that there were two moments, the Bekut and Iklachabut, that at some point, I don't know if I pronounce it were, uh, well, but yeah. it says that, uh, you were in this, uh, uh, in a, like a, a spiral of as, ascending yourself, the more and more that you pray or dance and sing with, uh, with the tools that are the nigunim, uh, particularly for the Hasidim, that you reach this moment that you were more aware of the spiritual world than in the material world that was around you. And that was something like, uh, here is suggesting us that uh, the more that we uh, seek Hashem, the more that we will acknowledge Him in, as uh, this parent-child uh, relationship, and uh, also uh, that it's like a, a three-step process. Like one is the repetition thing, is that uh, some people say that faith, you have to listen and to repeat certain things, and certainly we don't pray here in uh, a shul or, or, or when we are by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We listen, so that's for the intellect, and then that becomes to the heart, which is something that is inner, and then hopefully it becomes an action or a deed or a, or a mitzvah. So they're related, and at some point it's, like a, it's not just repeating like uh, some philosophies uh, say that, repeat and focus and uh, and declare or, or decree what is that uh, it's better to focus on those things that are going to uplift and uh, give us benefit than being uh, low down thinking that oh I am a, a worm and uh, no we should try to to go to the uplifting uh, way Simcha I see that you don't just read, you really pay attention to what you read. I have a good teacher. Well, thanks, but I think that one came from you. 
Um, I'm gonna. I'm going to. Ra I'm going to um, uh, raise two different ideas. One to conclude the text that we read, and one to uh, present the text that follows. To conclude the text that we read, it's important to have a, a general picture of the different approaches to uh, Jewish prayer. The basic model is what we can call simple prayer or plain, plain prayer. In, in plain prayer, talking to God is just like talking to another person. God may be stronger, more powerful, more capable, but, but God is like a person. You talk to God, basically, just like you talk to anyone else. You know, if you're in a relationship with someone, someone, then you praise the person, you express your esteem and regard for the person, you should be very grateful for that person being in your life and and doing whatever they do for you. And sometimes also you, you need something and so you ask for it, okay? To a person, a human being that you're in a relationship with. In the plain, simple model, model of prayer, God is exactly like that, okay? You express the same things to God and you mean the same thing by it as you would to another human being. That is a very beautiful model and a very powerful model, but that model has one big weakness, one big, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a flaw, but one, one big problem that leads people to abandon it. Okay? I, I, yeah, and I the know. problem, yeah, yes, I'm sorry? I think that I know what's, what's that. <laughs> what do you think the problem is? That because it's done, done in our own uh, way, like the common way that I talk to you or address uh, somebody that I'm related to, yeah. I think that uh, it's not heard. That it has some flaws or that I'm maybe being disrespectful or that, that, that it doesn't go. Uh, you're saying that it's disrespectful to talk to God as you would to just a regular human being. Disrespectful in the sense that uh, that I don't think that I might be using like the the formula or 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 being uh, okay. uh, uh, using the proper ways. But that's that, that's a of within us that we don't believe that 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 can be heard because it's done like a very inf in an informal way. Okay. The Simcha, what, 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 you're, what, what the example you gave is touching on is that God is not a human being. Okay? The, 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 the plain, simple approach to prayer depends on God being like a human being. But people would ask, how can you say that? God is not a human being. So how can you talk to God like you would talk to a human being? You said maybe it sounds disrespectful, and that's one aspect of it. The, 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 the attack on that view is that God is not a human being, so you cannot talk to God as if God was a human being. And once you ask that question, and once you accept its premise, you, you need a different model. Well, you can just stop praying, but if you're going to keep praying, then you need a different conceptual model of prayer. One of those models is the rationalistic model, and I spoke about it uh, just a moment ago regarding Rabbi Shamshan Rafael Hirsch. It's to say, yes, God is not like a human being. You don't talk to God as if God was a human being. In fact, you don't really talk to God at all. You're really just talking to yourself. Prayer is to improve you. Prayer is supposed to have an effect on you. It's not supposed to have an effect on God. That's the rational way of looking at prayer. And finally, the third way agrees. The third way says, God is not a human being. And you cannot really talk to God and mean it as you'd mean it to a human being, even if the words sound similar. Rather, 
there are all of these spiritual universes, which the Kabbalah calls the Sfirot, the ten Sfirot. And there's male, and there's female, and there's love, and there's conflicts, and all kinds of things are going on up there. And your job when you pray is not to pray for yourself, it's to pray for them. Okay, that's the mystical model of prayer in a nutshell. And now I'm going to ask you all a question. Of those three models, the, the plain model of prayer, where you just talk to God like you would talk to a human being, the rational model of prayer, which says you're not really talking to God, you're talking just to yourself, and the mystical model of prayer, which says you're not praying for yourself, you're not asking for things that you need. Rather, you are praying for the Shekhinah, you're praying for the upper worlds, you're praying for blessing, okay, amongst these spherot. Of those three models, which do you think Rabbi Kalanim is Kalman Shapira's model of prayer fits into? Number one, number two, or number three? Number three, I think. The three is the most likely. Of the people who started to speak up, speak up clearly and speak up. I think it's number one. He's telling the children to talk to God okay. as they would to his father, to a child to his father. Okay. He's I saying, agree. Talk to God just like you talk to a human being like your father. Okay. Who spoke next? I think it has a, a, a little bit of each one. <laughs> a little bit of each one. <laughs> because we have to, we have to uh, first uh, use the you, as, as Marion stated. Like, uh, and the you, not uh, applying them, but in the paternal way, like the parent-child. Like the yeah. person we know that we are related to. But in the other, we also have to pray with knowledge. Like, uh, for example, in the no, in the first option, I would have to pray uh, pray according to my needs or what's happening here that might not sound uh, very uh, spiritual. Yeah. But then I would have to believe that uh, God and the heavenly beings and the Shekinah and Spirit are are steps to to achieve. Uh, and to answer my prayer, at least mm. somehow to comfort me. So I, I uh, that requires, uh, it's like, a, I, I would say like an orange. Each step is part of the orange. Okay, okay. Other people? Yeah, I had another comment. He's yeah. speaking to children. Now yes. children are not necessarily going to understand that they're speaking to themselves or that they're speaking to pray for the Shekinah. I think they will understand talking to God as to a father. Okay, okay. If he's speaking to children, you're saying, it must be the plain, simple model of prayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Others? I, I, yeah, hi. I think he's asking children to start the relationship with Hashem that way uh -huh. with the intention that it then rises to, like he says, then what you'll look up and feel the chariots and the, the looking into the eyes of God. That's a very personal relationship, but the personal relationship is also going to become embodied. And when it's embodied, it also goes into the mind. And it's going mm -hmm. to be something that becomes reflexive so that the okay. uh, child becomes in connection with understanding uh, that, um, that the child is, that everything is, is let's say, God-given. And mm -hmm. um, it, will, it will raise the child's understanding over time by starting simply. Okay. So, so you even found a way to, to bring the irrational view into this. 
I guess so. <laughs> but what you said makes sense. Okay, others? Elisha has been very quiet. Go ahead. I thought I heard somebody speak. As I said, I've had to be in two places at once. But uh -huh. I, I did say that I disagreed with what Marion said first. And children here, that, that his primary message is making a relationship. You talk mm -hmm. to this other being in a way that you develop a relationship. And then what grows from that afterwards and what grows from that when the child grows up and becomes an adult may be a little different. But, mm -hmm. but I think in many ways, that's where we all start, no matter how old we are. Okay, okay. Well, he definitely tells the child, he, he says it explicitly, to start off with the simple model of prayer, right? That when you need something, use it to turn to God, okay? But he also tells the child quite, quite towards the beginning, right, that, that you don't only need to God, turn to God when you need something, even if you don't need something from your father, it's nice to look in his eyes. It's nice to hug him. Okay? And um, all of that, by the way, can still fit into the plain, uh, to the plain um, simple model. He does suggest, he does suggest ultimately, uh, ultimately that, that praying because you need something is, is somewhat of a, uh, it's only the first step, it's only a, maybe a, a lesser le level, maybe it's only meant as a trigger towards the real thing. And that might hint towards the Kabbalistic view or towards the way that, uh, that was just mentioned now about the uh, rationalistic view. It, it feels like somehow he succeeds in, in covering them all at once. That's what Simcha said. Yeah. Okay. And quite frankly, I don't know of another text which manages to do that. Usually texts, they, they push one of these three views of prayer to the exclusion of the, uh, of the others. And this, uh, this one somehow uh, manages to uh, blend them all together. Okay, so that was a, a concluding question for the, uh, for the text that we read. And just to get you into the uh, next text, which I guess we'll have time to at least start, um, we need to talk a little bit about the soul and the body, and more specifically, where does the soul live inside the body? Okay, okay. Um, Okay, there's a theory, there's a theory that was prominent in the Middle Ages, and then it continued in Jewish mysticism right up into the writings of Rav Kalamaris Kalam Shapira, that a person has three souls. Some of you might remember this from the preface to, uh, to Maimonides' eight chapters. He, he doesn't agree with this opinion, but he mentions this opinion. The opinion is that there is a it's something we might call life or nefesh resides inside of the liver. And then you have something we might call ruach or, or spirit. It resides in the heart. And then you have something called, um, uh, you have something called nishama, which resides in the mind and is perhaps the, uh, the bearer of wisdom. The nefesh uh, inside uh, of Avi, your uh, your smooth, yeah. your, uh, your picture, your audio, your video is off. It's off. I, I can't even touch anything. Nothing is moving. Hold on. I don't see you here. No, now I see Avi. I didn't before. Oh, you see Avi? Okay. I didn't touch anything. I didn't turn the video off. There's but it looks my, look, it looks like part at least one thing on my computer. It looks like the Zoom is frozen. 
Yeah, you were frozen for a while, then your picture disappeared, yes. now you're back and moving again. I now you're frozen you. again. <laughs> I think, I think oh, I see, I see you think, moving. I think you all brought me back to life. <laughs> I don't see okay. anything now. I see a blank screen. I, I will tell you that I, on my screen, I still see the text that Simcha read about half an hour ago. It hasn't moved. You have to, yeah. Ah, we, we are not seeing X right now. What? We're just seeing pictures, or at least oh, I am. not seeing text at all. The text was already shut off. Nope. Okay. So uh, yep. yeah, my, 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 it looks like my Zoom is frozen. I, it, it's, it, it's happened before. Usually yeah, you're frozen again. This has happened, what? You it may be the vagaries of people's internet connection. They do fluctuate and do things like that. Okay. I haven't been able to um, figure it out. Avi, just a quick uh, question. Yes. A quick question. Yes. Where did you say the Ruach, uh, not the Ruach, hold on. Yeah, where does the Ruach reside? In the heart. Okay, again. In the the heart. Nefesh, okay. the life, resides in the liver. The Ruach, the spirit, resides in the heart. And the Neshama, the soul, resides in the brain. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. I take notes. Uh, thanks for getting <laughs> yeah. that topic. And, um, and yes, so th this is a, uh, a, a medieval theory of like what, how people, what makes people tick, okay? In the liver, you have biological drives, food, water, breathing, letting out waste, reproduction, things like that. That all comes from the liver, all biological drives. Then in the heart, you have very this-worldly drives, but which are not connected to something, um, to something material. For instance, the drive towards honor or to flee from shame or the drive for revenge, okay? These are things that are located inside of the heart. And then you have the soul. The soul, I'll describe uh, the way Rabbi Kalenimus Kamen Shapira described it, that the soul is the daughter of God. God wants a good, close relationship with his daughter. That's how he described it in the uh, text here. I don't know if he used the word daughter, but that's what, he, uh, that's what he's, he's getting at. He says that um, he wants the soul to draw close with him, okay? And God will do I, I thought it was more anything of, I just to was... get the soul to come close. What? I didn't think it was so much daughter as almost more like a marital relationship with the spirit. You can use all, you can use all, of these, uh, all of these models or analogies. I think the reason I said daughter is because I'm working on a book right now that does call the soul a princess and a daughter. She's like a princess that was shipped off to a, 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 a farm family when she was an infant and grew up there. And then all of a sudden, it's revealed that she's really the princess and she reunites with her father. That, that's a, a different book that I'm reading right now. Okay? But, but it fits here too. It, it, doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really matter one way or the other. What matters here is that God wants this relationship. God wants the soul to turn, okay, and to, to see him and to, and to talk to him and to be close to him, okay? Uh, but notice that God is much less looking for the, uh, looking for the ruach or the nefesh in the, uh, in the liver or the heart. With that introduction, we can begin to read the next text. If Simcha is willing to, that's great. If someone else wants to, or if Simcha is tired, let me know. Where will you put it? Are you going to, uh, are you going to screen it? Uh, 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 well, well, it uh, wait, it, the text that I gave you ended? Mm -hmm. I, I took it off. I got taken I, down. I took oh, it, it got down. taken down. Okay. Uh, yeah, could you put it back up? Put it back up. All right. There's a, another section called Torah, Prayer, and Singing to God. OK. 
Okay. It's like sort of in the middle or two thirds. Uh, okay. You found it? Yep, it's right. It's on I'm screen. not seeing it, so I can't check. So I'll just trust you. Does everybody see it? It's on screen? Yes. Yes. My screen's still frozen. Okay. Okay. Um, are you good to go, Simcha? Or you want to pass it on? No, it's okay. Okay, then, Vakasha. From Torah, prayer and singing to God. Since we wish to discuss the arousal of the Ruach and Nefesh and other intellect, we will be able to explain ourselves using intellectual analysis or logical argument. We will have to instead bring some examples from the world. Let me just explain what's going on here. He's trying to explain to a student, but now it's a bit, it's an older student. It's not a, um, it's not a child anymore. It's a young adult. He's trying to explain a young adult the difference between the things that I just told you, the three souls and the liver and the heart and the mind. And he says, I cannot explain this to you logically. Rather, I have to bring examples from the world, meaning it has to be from experience rather than from analysis. And this is the key nexus or the key, uh, the key difference between philosophy and mysticism. In mysticism, everything will ultimately come from experience. And, you, and even if you know something logically, you don't really know it. And in philosophy, you only really know something if you've proven it or defined it. And he is leaning towards the mystical way. Okay, go ahead. Um, we will have to instead bring some examples from the world. Mm -hmm. Is it possible, for instance, to explain the following fact using, using logic or analysis? Take a person whose spirit is diffuse, whose thoughts are scattered and insignificant and have no general theme connecting them to a single great nexus. Imagine that such a person wishes to unite all his thoughts, direct them toward one central point. He will certainly find such a task very difficult indeed. Yet, that evening at a Simha Torah, and begins to dance with all his might. Suddenly, he's transformed, healed. If he had refrained from dancing, his psyche would have stayed in its weakened condition. As he danced, he was not necessarily in a state of expanded consciousness. He may have had only simple thoughts such as this. This is God's Torah. For her sake, we have spilled our blood constantly. I will dance and rejoice with my God, with the Torah, which is my soul and my life. During the course of the dancing, he feels himself cleansed of all profane worries and concerns. They fall away from him like sand and dust from a coast one has shaken in the wind. His soul is refined and elevated. His inner thoughts and feelings become purified, bright, and clear as the sky. The fact that a physical activity, dancing, has had such a profound effect on his soul and mind cannot be explained logically. Yet this is true. Physical activities stimulate the soul, strengthen it, and to an extent, reveal it. My first thought for this paragraph was, he really should have discovered yoga. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If I thought. You, go ahead. Yeah. I thought of the, the Baal Shem Tov, who wanted people to start dancing and, and expressing themselves to God because they couldn't pray any other way. And this was how they exactly how they did it. Okay. Here, he's not talking necessarily about someone who's ignorant. He's talking about someone who's not focused. And he says, 
you're not going to get focused um, through analysis. Rather, you're going to get focused from doing something through experience. Okay. Take another example. At times, a person may wish to pray with an awakened heart and an aroused soul, and yet he finds himself unable. His heart and soul are blocked. He starts to, to pronounce the words of the prayer out loud, as the holy books suggest, not for the sake of the volume, but as if he were straining to roll away a boulder that has been stopping up the source of his heart and soul. He says the words of the prayer as they were intended when they were written. That is, he doesn't just try to understand what each word means. He tries to mean the words. If you could just hold on there for a second. That sentence is, is very powerful, okay? Mm -hmm. We sometimes talk about praying with meaning, praying with kavana, praying directing the heart, okay? And we know that a lot of people don't pray like that. They just pray by rote. Many, many people say that what causes prayer by rote is a lack of understanding. I don't know Hebrew. I don't know, you know, rabbinic texts and biblical texts. So, you know, so how can I, how can I mean what I say if I'm not learned? And people think that because they're not learned or because they don't know Hebrew at all, that's why they don't have a kavana. The suggestion then given, which is of course a good suggestion is, okay, take a translation, right? Someone can teach you the meaning of the words and that's all very fine. The problem with it is, is that while lack of understanding is, you know, it's important and it should be dealt with, lack of understanding is not really what causes the lack of meaning. And the proof of it is that even the learned people don't have any more sincerity than the people who don't know Hebrew. You can have an astounding scholar who knows the Bible by heart, right? And the prayer of that person may have zero kavanah. Okay, so understanding is important, but understanding is not meaning. Understanding is not kavanah. That does not mean in any way that you're necessarily going to have kavanah. And in the sentence that Simcha just read, he distinguishes between these two things. Some people think that kavanah is to think of the meaning of the words as you say them. He says, no, kavana is not to think of the meaning of the words. Rather, kavana is to mean the words. And the words that Simcha read, he doesn't just try to understand what each word means. He tries to mean the words. This has to be you talking and you meaning what you say. It's not just a matter of understanding words. Yeah, I have to, uh, when my husband uh, first started going to a conservative synagogue, when yeah. we moved to Long Island, he went mm -hmm. with a man who was, who walked with a man who was much more knowledgeable, much more observant than he ever was. And yeah. he kept asking questions to this friend of his. And once he said to the friend, he said, uh, aren't you annoyed? I, I, I didn't say that a burden or I don't know how we put it that I keep asking you these questions and the friend said no it makes me think of the answers and I have more kavana whatever I understand what I'm doing better okay. makes me think okay so that person Where's felt he had more kavana through more understanding it can be true right understanding can be helpful of course kavana well, understanding what he was doing, why he yeah. was doing it. But, but understanding is, is perhaps a, um, what's the word? It's perhaps a condition for kavana, but it is not kavana. Because even if you understand, you still might not mean what you say. 
I, yeah. I would act, hello? Yes. Uh, let's see, I, I'll put on my video just because I'm doing, you know, talking. Um, I okay. would actually, I can't see myself, but that's okay. I would actually say uh, that you can also have Kavanaugh without understanding. Because sometimes it's like, if you, nice. wait, if you wait till you understand, um, you may not get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. some things are beyond understanding. Like I, when people talk, speak as if they really understand God, I'm like, how can yeah. you possibly understand God? You know, God is so much bigger than anything I can wrap my head around. And trying to wrap my head around God just gets me to that state that he was talking about of like being overwhelmed with logic. And really the okay. logic isn't going to get me there. It's going to be the experience, not the logic. It's going to be the feeling, not the logic. Very nice, very nice. So yeah. I'm just I wish I could explain that to my son. A condition. <laughs> I think I missed something. This friend said to my husband, I had been doing it by rote. And, and now yeah. I'm not anymore. Yeah, so that person understood rote as being without understanding. Mm. Rabbi Kalani Miskaman Shapiro, with all due respect, doesn't agree. I think oh, I it would be hard to mean something if yeah. you don't understand it, what do you mean? True. That's if, why I initially don't understand said, it. Yes, that's but why I initially said that maybe understanding is a condition. The truth is, it you can you can it see it as a be. condition, but maybe it's not. I don't think it is. I mean, I love understand. I believe me. I, I I love when I'm reading the when I'm reading prayers and I understand the words and I can go deeply into the words. Yeah. Um, linguistically and look at the different levels from the Shoresh. I mean, I get, I, I, it's not that I'm saying mm -hmm. um, that I don't think we need the meaning, but I'm also saying that there are some things that are beyond my comprehension and I don't need right. to understand them in order to still, in order to yeah. pray to God. Because if, if I had to wait until I understood God, I could never pray. You, you can have a lot of meaning Personally. even without full understanding, or even with almost no understanding. The most famous Hasidic stories uh, are exactly about that, right? About the person who doesn't know how to pray and doesn't know anything. And, you know, he, he whistles or he says the Aleph Bet. My God favorite assembles is that one into who the says prayer. the Aleph Bet and asks what? God to put them together in the right order. Right, right. that's the story, right? And those stories indicate that even with no understanding at all, you can have meaning in your heart. Gabi, we're uh, coming to the end of our, uh, of our time. Uh, of our time. So, what, what, should we finish the paragraph at least? Yeah. Because he's gonna, he's gonna wind up this thought. Okay, well, Simcha, could you finish? No. The paragraph. No, for example, when he says, praise God, call on his name, he imagines himself standing opposite the whole world and shouting out to them, give praise to God. Are you all asleep? Call out his name. If he were too simple, think this intention in his heart, as he whispered the words, it would not have the same effect. Calling up loudly awakens his nefesh to an extent and excites it to pray passionately. Why is the voice more capable of arousing the soul than the intellect? The nefesh and ruach are both spiritually higher and lower than the intellect. They are lower because the neshama, which is the source of the light of the intellect, is higher than nefesh and ruach. They are higher because they have an ability to reveal the soul. Uh, I need the text uh, to be... Uh, they have the ability, thank you. They have the ability, they have an ability to reveal the soul that surpasses that of wisdom and mind. That is quite a thought, that these biological and this worldly drives, they're lower than the soul, and yet 
they have the power to arouse the soul. The soul is concerned with wisdom, but wisdom doesn't arouse the soul. It's physical things, this worldly things, right? It's li lively things that arouse the soul, like talking out loud or shouting out loud or dancing or singing. These are things which arouse the soul, and yet they come from the lower parts, in his view, of the human being. In fact, he doesn't even say they're the lower parts. He says they're both lower and higher at the very same time. And that okay. brings me, we'll, okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, that brings me back to my question from last week, which bothered me the entire week. And, has, and, 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 and that I looked at also when I read Chukotai, because the whole question of, yes. uh, of do we really need to be um, oppressed? And do we really need to be in danger for us to be, remain a people? What's wrong with us as a people that this is necessary? And to me, what's wrong, what's been wrong with us for, for centuries has been the way we educate our children about being Jewish, uh, where it's a, so much okay. pain and so much suffering. And, so, and we have to remember, and, I, and it's important, we have to remember the Choldor Vador, we have to remember the Holocaust, blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, and I don't mean blah, blah, blah. That sounds so disrespectful. But what I really mean is because we haven't educated them in the joy and in the mm -hmm. and 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 to and to be or or we haven't done it enough where it's something joyous yeah. and it's not because we're being oppressed yeah. it's because it's something that we desire uh in the maybe in this physical way you know that that how are we going to bring people around mm -hmm. to judaism and we have failed the children of the united states that i know i don't know in israel okay on that this, note let's uh <laughs> Let's bring it forward to next week. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you, you remind me of a you remind me of a rabbi that I once knew, an older rabbi of a dying yeah. congregation where most of the mm. Jews have moved out of town. Usually, almost nobody came. But on Yom Kippur, you know, every Jew who still lived in town would come, and people would even come from other towns, and he'd have quite a crowd on Yom Kippur. And every Yom Kippur, he would cry. And he would tell people, I'm not crying because people come just one, once a year to shul. That's not why I'm crying. If people want to come just once a year to shul, I can live with that. Let them come just once a day, to, once a year to shul. What I'm crying about, he says, is that the day they choose is Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. Okay? That they come on the day that is the hardest and the most difficult and the most intense and 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 that's the one day they come he says why can't they come on a happy day once a year like shabbat or like <laughs> simchat torah exactly and maybe that connects a little bit uh with your uh with your final comment uh-huh okay it's so we'll what well let's let's finish it up let's close it up we'll we'll, we'll stop here thank you and um, there, there's, there's a lot more good stuff in the, for, from the uh, Vakalani Miskam and Shapira. Mm -hmm. we'll all right. See you next week. So we'll see you all next week. See you. Thank you. Have a good week. And thanks especially to the people, uh, you know, who, uh, who, who participated.